My name is Tovio Roberts. I'm a data science instructor at Galvanize. Um, if you're watching this, you probably already heard or saw my bio. Um, but uh, just, you know, quick cap. Um, I have, uh, you know, 15 plus years of software development experience, mostly as a contracted developer. And uh, I did that because I was touring with, with bands and touring as a circus performer. Um, I'm a professional juggler. And I transitioned out of that into uh, special needs education for college students on the autism spectrum who were in STEM fields, uh, mostly uh, computer science and uh, related fields. Um, and I like to make art and music and, uh, you know, so I paint and I also play around with generative models for music and art. And uh, beyond that, I'm really fascinated by pedagogy and andragogy. So I spend a lot of time studying and thinking about better ways to teach and learn. Uh, so I work at Galvanize, and uh, if you want to know more about them, uh, you know, uh, Google us. And basically, we are a, a data science boot camp. Uh, well, we have a data science boot camp, and we also have a lot of other aspects of our company. So the crux of what I want to talk about is concerned with relational ethics, accuracy of perception, and some pitfalls of categorical and reductive thinking. I have two quotes here, and I want to use these quotes to frame everything I'm talking about. One is from uh, Ababa Berhani. Uh, Relational ethics helps you leave whatever solution you have somewhat partially open so that you can reiterate, so that you can revise and change with whatever new evidence or new data comes up. Our solution now is only for now, within a limited context within a limited environment. And I have a quote here from Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's a professor of neurology and neurological sciences at Stanford. We take things that are continua and we break them into categories. When you're paying too much attention to categories, you can't differentiate two facts that fall within the same category. When you put up boundaries, you have trouble seeing how similar things are on either side of it. When you pay too much attention to boundaries, you don't see the big picture. All you see are categories. So what I'm talking about here will be partially about marketing and mostly about the efficacy and problems related to the use of personas within marketing. I'll be talking about an alternative to personas found in the continued simple utility of topic models like Leighton Dirichlet allocation. And at times I'm going to point out tendencies in business uh, that you know, reflect social systemic issues. I'm going to start with the story of a company. I went ahead and invented a company called Leash. I'm going to use Leash to contextualize how personas might be applied. Now, this is a totally made up uh, scenario to serve as some archetype uh, of a company that many of us have seen play out, okay? So Leash is a reasonably sized startup are uh, reasonably small, but reasonably sized, that specializes in providing crowdsourced dog walking, sort of like an Uber, but for booking a walk for your dog. We have this organizational structure. We have a CEO sitting in a relationship with marketing, human resources, a small legal team, and a sales team. We have a uh, CTO who mostly works with the front and back end developers. Let's imagine there's somewhere around 150 people who work at Leash. Let's also consider that the data scientist might be contracted in, given that the revenue model is not necessarily centered around the value of the data. The value proposition of this company is really the service, which is pairing of gig economy dog walkers with the paying customers who want their dogs walked. And let's assume that there is a small design team and an analyst connected to the marketing team. Although the app designers and the marketing design team uh, share aesthetics, they're mostly separated as they're working on different problems, but within the same brand. The app devs are concerned with delivery and functionality of the app and marketing wants to acquire and sustain users. Let's say Leash is active in a few US metropolitan areas, including New York, Chicago, Denver, and uh, let's just imagine a few others. The main idea here is the regions they serve are diverse in a number of ways. And let's say Leash gets the idea that they want to better know their customers. So this brings us to personas. 
Personas are a widely accepted method to approach building a customer-centered narrative by helping design teams empathize with users. More specifically, in this, uh, in this quote from Pruitt and Adlin, a persona represents an aggregate of target users who share common behavioral characteristics, in other words, a hypothetical archetype of real users. And the main pioneer of personas, Alan Cooper, states that uh, real users are not elastic. Well, I don't think I agree with that, um, but let's go forward and, and talk about this a little bit more. So a key material aspect of the persona strategy is a persona description, which is a one page sort of character sheet of a user. It's meant to give basis or descriptions of a made up person's goals, motivations, and maybe their behaviors. There's often a stock photo, a name, age, story, and other things. Uh, these persona descriptions are intended to be resources for marketing, design, UX devs, uh, sales teams, and they represent something like a quintessential customer. The hypothesis here is that if a designer considers a persona description as a real person with thoughts, feelings, a story, experiences, then the process of design will be a human-centered process. This is all part of human-centered design. Anyway, uh, let's look at an example of a persona. Uh, that's actually, uh, that's a joke. It's a character sheet from Dungeons and Dragons, um, but let's move on. Our company, Leash, decides that it's going to make six personas, three for the customers that are hiring dog walkers and three for the dog walkers themselves. They enlist the da data analyst in marketing to perform a fairly extensive analysis of both of those user groups. Let's assume that the data includes people's addresses, addresses uh, as well as some volunteer demographic data like age, gender, uh, there's a discernible profile picture. There are extensive descriptions of the dogs. People love telling you about their dogs. The analyst pulls keywords from the descriptions, such as adopted from shelter, uh, things like that. The data naturally contains number of walks requested by customers or performed by dog walkers. At the request of marketing and upper management, the analyst also scrapes people's social media for education and employment background. Addresses of customers are tied to median income and median house values of neighborhoods. And given the photos of customers, race is inferred in three categories, white, non-white, and black. So I think some of you might already be imagining some issues that might be emerging in our hypothetical persona process, but let's leave that for a little bit. The, uh, the analyst finishes uh, their analysis hands off to the marketing director. All agents find the analysis to be validating, but not necessarily surprising. And to make the persona descriptions themselves, the analysis is handed off to a contracted individual who specializes in personas. That person mocks up six persona descriptions, uh, some poetic licenses allowed in the, data, in the design process, um, because that helps to create really relatable characters when you make personas. And I'm about to show you some mockups. Um, I'm hoping that you'll be thinking about what might be sort of wrong with these and uh, what might be wrong with this type of representation in general. So the personas are as follows. We have Karen Whitlock, she's 43, she's a, a woman, she's white. Um, her persona category is the Valkyrie, um, let's say. And this is common, people, uh, people who design personas will name personas, things like this, oftentimes. Um, she lives in the Wash Park neighborhood of Denver, uh, makes uh, about 200,000 a year. Um, there's a goal here, you know, um, that's expressed in a quote, like, like she's talking. The idea is you look at this and you imagine this person talking with you. And uh, she primarily uses leash because she has two dogs. One has, um, one's older and one's younger and the younger one's very excitable and needs to be walked more. And she, it looks like she hires leash about four times a week. We also have things in here under the attributes, her attributes like wealthy, she's liberal, she's uh, tech savvy, um, she's an extrovert, she's analytical more than creative, and she's active more than passive. And of course, she has uh, these D&D &D specs that we can use to battle uh, the personas against each other later if we want. Here's the bachelor, uh, Ben Chaddington, um, lives in uptown, uh, the uptown neighborhood of Chicago. He uses the app uh, for walks about two times a week. Um, tends to be more conservative, uh, an introvert, and more analytical. And um, his reason for using Leash is that 
uh, he has strict work deadlines that prevent him from, you know, prevent him from uh, being able to walk his dog as often as he wants to. Uh, we have Alicia Montoya. Uh, she uses the app five times a week. Um, she's in the first year of her master's degree and she's also working and she just can't make the time. Um, she's more liberal, she's more creative and uh, yeah. And so those are the persona, the three personas for our customers. Let's go get into the personas for the employees who are actually walking the dogs. We have Jared Whitby. He's 23, uh, Caucasian, um, lives in the lower height of San Francisco and he's a dog walker, okay? So um, this is one of those things that happens in the creation of personas. We're really excited that this person's into our product. Um, so he's a dog walker and makes around 23,000 a year. Um, Leash gives Jared the freedom to pursue other activities. He even lets the more energetic dogs pull him on a skateboard with the owner's permission, of course. Okay. And um, more active, more liberal, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, D and D. Okay. Uh, we have Siad Laskar, uh, who lives in Los Angeles in the Panorama City neighborhood, uh, makes around 42,000 a year, um, 18 leash walks a week. He works at leash um, because it gives him uh, the opportunity to make a little extra money while he plans to open a business, which is described here. We have Desiree Fullerton, who is a woman. She's black. She's got uh, a kid. She lives in the Benteen Park neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia. And in her story, it shows that she grew up there. And her reason here is uh, she can make extra money for the household while caring for her son. Uh, since she grew up and lives in the neighborhood, she personally knows many of the neighbors who, whose dogs that she walks. Um, she's uh, upper middle, uh, like on the edge of being upper middle class, liberal, um, and more of an extrovert. Okay. So I'm going to point out some of the things that I see as wrong with uh, these persona descriptions. The first thing is that personas are a reductive approach to understanding a population of people. In an effort to humanize design and development, there's been this invention of an imaginary cast of characters that fit with the predisposed worldview held by the individual creating the personas. So why is that a problem? Um, for one thing, these stories, as human humanizing as they are, they don't capture the wealth of stories that actually exist in the population. Imagine how difficult it is to write something like a median story. Any, fabrica any fabricated story here is a single individuated instance of an imaginary character. And I think that's a problem. Um, not, not a permanent, uh, not, not a complete problem. There are ways to do this well, sure, but I think that's a problem. And I think it's dishonesty in this case through convenience and poetic license. And I think it's misleading within our hypothetical company. So I'm going to assume that the designer of these persona descriptions is white and that they're doing their best to enact diversity and inclusion, but there's still an experience of whiteness as being the common experience. The first persona is a white woman, the second a white man, the first dog walker is a white man. And this is reflective of what I've seen in personas in the real world. Uh, I'm not just making this up. I'm uh, These personas do not look unlike personas I've seen enacted at companies. Um, and further, even if there is a reasonable amount of diversity in terms of employees working at Leash, the people who will be designing according to these persona descriptions will be asking themselves questions like, would Karen or Ben appreciate and respond to this ad campaign? Let's consider personas uh, in another light as a segmentation strategy and consider this in terms of, say, real estate. Home buyers have different needs and different budgets and channel channeling them towards uh, specific facilitators of those needs at budget seems like a reasonable thing to do, right? Well, that really depends. If any of you are familiar with the history of redlining in the US, you might already be considering some potential deep issues with that kind of an approach. If you aren't familiar with redlining, um, the short story is that federal agencies and real estate companies, uh, they have a history of intentionally preventing people of color and especially black people from moving into many neighborhoods in the US. So you can see that there is a conflation that occurs between economic class and race when segmentation occurs along income lines. Um, add to that discrimination uh, based on race or ethnicity. And you can see how a persona segmentation approach in real estate, let's say specifically in real estate, can easily turn into a form of segregation. So we can expand this dilemma to, let's say, a school system that institutes a series of persona descriptions for students. And I think you can imagine why personas 
might have a strong potential to create institution around discriminatory practices. And the final thing uh, I want to mention is there's a fundamental flaw from a business perspective uh, in making this sort of normative assumption that underwrites personas. Few people actually resemble some archetype of normalcy, and people have a great variety of reasons to use a given product or service. Yes, we can often generalize, like a dog walker at leash might want to work there because they get some extra exercise or they uh, make they want to make a little bit of extra money. And I think that's fair, uh, intuitively fair, right? However, if we reduce to only a small handful of personas, then we potentially reduce ourselves to only a small set of customer motivations. And when we do that, I believe we narrow our view of the people who utilize our products and we narrow our view of our own product's utility. Now, I could go further down this rabbit hole of everything that might be wrong with personas, but I'd rather propose a reasonably simple alternative approach. Um, I want to suggest that topic modeling can give us better views into the stories and interests of people who use our products. Um, given that we have text data on our users, we can apply a topic model to discover hidden topical patterns, annotate the documents in the text corpus, and utilize the results. Uh, so the topic model that I'm going to focus on is latent Dirichlet allocation. It's well known and it's been widely used since uh, soon after its inception in 2003. So there's nothing revolutionary happening here. Uh, I'm not suggesting anything revolutionary, except uh, can we maybe do this instead of personas in marketing? Um, can we build tools based on top of topic modeling? Um, so I'm going to be somewhat surface level regarding the inner workings of LDA. If you want a deeper treatment, there are a number of links in the slide deck. Um, there's a set of lectures linked here where it says topic models by David Bly. These are really great. Um, and the math in them is really fun. And uh, I also have a notebook here with a bunch of math. Um, but uh, the core premise here is that a document can be thought of as a probability distribution over some number of topics. And a topic can be, can be considered as a probability distribution over a fixed vocabulary. So a uh, high level view of LDA. Um, it's a generative model in that it optimizes toward generating the words of a given document by way of that document's topic distribution. So if you think about it, that's a bit weird, right? Because when we write a document, we don't think in terms of, I want this to be 5% computer words, 10% fishing words, 35% horror movie related, and 50% words about cats. Um, I mean, I want that document to exist, but I wouldn't know offhand how to write it. Essentially, LDA guesses at topic uh, at the document topic distributions, and it generates words for each document, compares the generated document to the specific document, and uses statistical inference to adjust the distributions of words within the given topics and adjust the topic distributions in each document. So why LDA? Um, although LDA is fairly old at this point, it's really easy. It's easy to implement. And more importantly, it's uh, the, interpre the interpretation of the results of LDA um, are really accessible and or, or fairly accessible. Let me say fairly accessible. Also, um, there are quick and easy tools available to visualize LDA. Um, there are more. There are actually more performant topic models out there that are pretty amazing. Uh, I link to uh, a little Python uh, library here called Tomotopy. Uh, Tomotopy. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. But um, but that said, I'm advocating here for LDA to be used specifically as an alternative strategy to personas because it's easy to use and describe. And some of these other models are more complex and they don't have necessarily as rich a set of tools for visualizing the results. Um, I was actually hoping uh, to throw together a Kibi app for this lecture, but I ran out of time. Um, if, I get, if I get that together in the next couple of weeks, I'll make sure to post it on my LinkedIn. So we have data. I made a quick toy data set for our hypothetical company, Leash, and I put that in a Google Colab, which i am uh, I'll go ahead and share that link now in the chat. OK. Um, so I'll go ahead and open the Google Colab, and we'll take a look at this data. All right. So I'll go ahead and uh, import a bunch of stuff. And there's a little installation that might have to happen here, but um, it, it'll be quick. And you know, feel free to open this up and play around with it. If you, um, if you haven't played around with LDA before, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great 
uh, little model and it it's really fun and um, it's it has a lot of depth to it actually uh, if you dig into it a little further just because it's easy to implement and interpret um, it's it's pretty hard to dig into uh, you know the literature on it is a bit terse and um, but once you start getting it you're like oh this is this is pretty cool um, I'm going to uh, import data from uh, I just have these little data sets up on uh, GitHub. And uh, the main thing we're going to be working here, working with here is our uh, is this customer data that that I made up. Um, the profile descriptions are all, you know, just grabbed from the first few paragraphs of Wikipedia articles. And I kind of made these into classes where we have a musician, we have musicians, physicists, athletes, ma mathematicians, and actors. And the idea being that mathematicians and physicists are going to be tricky to discern. Musicians and actors are going to be tricky to, to discern. And we'll see that. Um, we're not going to use these dog descriptions, but there's a list of things to challenge you if, you, if you're so interested uh, at the end of this notebook. Um, so we'll just be using these profile descriptions. Uh, I also made um, a smaller data set uh, with 50 rows. Sorry, this first data set, the customers, has 100 rows. And we have the dog walker data set that has uh, 50 rows. And you can play around with that. OK, so you can see that there. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of these descriptions. Um, we have a professional footballer uh, who plays um, for the France national team. And we have King Sunny Ade, who's a Nigerian juju singer. And uh, so, you know, if we run this again, we'll get other random articles. But these are going to be uh, the things that we process to input to our LDA model. OK, so uh, now we'll prepare the text. Um, LDA accepts a bag of words. And uh, I broke out some steps here for the sake of learning, um, you know, so that when you get to it, you can play around with it. And um, you know, first, we initialize a vectorizer, which will convert our uh, rows of text into a sparse matrix of token counts. And it'll also drop common words in English, um, which we're calling stop words. And uh, we initialize a lemmatizer down here that will reform variants of a word into a single form. And we then uh, we also end up tokenizing the uh, documents. In other words, we represent each document as its own pouch of words within the greater corpus. And we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at that right down here. So we'll we'll look at the a few documents and their actual tokens. And maybe I can make this a little bit bigger, a little nicer to look at. Um, so uh, Bela Bartok, um, blah, blah, blah. And notice that uh, this might be the original document, but our tokens have reduced this down to this collection of words. Um, we don't include his name because it doesn't occur in, across enough documents, right? Um, we don't uh, include Franz Liszt uh, for the same reason, uh, although it would just be Franz and Liszt. So, um, we also have this other one. We can see, uh, well, this is uh, Tom Rello, um, and you know it reduces down to this. So uh, you can imagine there's a little bit of information loss that occurs when we do that. But um, in some ways, well, you can consider it to be maybe uh, removing a little bit of noise from our data. So once we have those tokens, we can do a couple things. We can uh, we can build a dictionary with the tokens. And um, then we can build this bag of words, which is named corpus here. So uh, just pointing this out, there's around 6,000 words across all the documents and about 1,300 unique words. So let's take a look at that bag of words just to get a sense of what that is. Um, we'll look at it uh, in light of a token. So. Um, here we've got uh, 28 tokens, uh, sorry, yeah, 28 tokens and 27 entries in this uh, bag of words in this term frequency. Um, and notice that uh, word ID 26 has two instances, which we can see here, degree and degree. So this is the form our data takes, and we're going to pass that into the LDA model down here. I'll start that running because it's going to take maybe 30, 40 seconds to run. Um, so we pass in a bag of words named corpus, and I set our number of topics to five. That's an arbitrary choice, OK? I chose five. 
um, because I have this assumption that maybe is unqualified or we'll see that there are five different classes of customer. And now that we have, uh, now that we have these topic outputs, right? Each of these is a topic. We can think about this. Okay. Um, we can see that topic zero has mathematician, year, university, mathematics, research, woman, degree, science. Maybe that topic has something to do with math. We don't, we want to be careful not to say it's a math topic, but it represents uh, characteristics of documents um, or characteristics uh, that are affiliated with our more mathematical classes, uh, I'm assuming. And then we've got prize, physicist, physic, work, Nobel, um, seems like that. Uh, topic one has to do with physics. Film, uh, actor, this probably has to do with actors. Uh, we've got player time record, professional team, probably sports. And then this one's a little weird. American born known singer, musician, music university father. Okay, well, maybe that's musicians, but um, let's just uh, take a look at this. So we can view the topic distributions for specific documents now that we have these. Um, oh, also uh, the sum, this is very convenient in these topics. A topic is composed of all words in our vocabulary. And each of these is the probability of that word occurring. And that, uh, you know, I'm only showing uh, here, I'm only showing eight of the words affiliated with each topic, but um, we actually have, you know, 1300 or so words uh, affiliated with each topic. Each of those words has a probability of occurring in regard to that topic. So uh, that's the way that you can interpret that. Okay, so um, I'm going to choose two random uh, descriptions and let's look at the topic distribution for those. So we've got uh, Chauncey Billups who uh, played for the Detroit Pistons uh, amongst other teams. Um, and it looks like his most prevalent topic is three. So let's go ahead and reference three up here. Player, time, born, team, one, professional, record, national. That makes sense, uh, right? Um, there's probably very little in here that's affiliated with the other uh, classes that we use to generate our data. And then we've got uh, this educator and mathematician, um, Etta Falconer. And if we look at her, uh, she has uh, topic zero, uh, topic two, and topic four. So let's look at those. Um, zero is mathematicians. Uh, two looks like actors and uh, yeah, it's interesting, right? Actor, television, award, you know, um, maybe there's something in that document that that's indicating that, but I, I doubt it. So, you know, LDA here might be um, a little broken or uh, there might be something a little bit different about that document, okay? Um, and for American born known singer, musician, university father, okay. So um, I don't see anything in here except for possibly, uh, you know, it could be that we have a couple African musicians in our data set and it might be um, uh, using these words to identify the musician topic, for example. Um, note that we would do better if we had more documents here and we would probably do better if our documents had more words in them. But this is purposeful uh, to kind of observe a little bit of a failure in this approach. Um, but I think uh, I think it's it's informative of the utility of this model. So we can also view the topic distribution for a new or unseen document or a user. So I've got this physicist here, Jules Ahrens, and um, I just tokenize and create a bag of words out of um, this paragraph. Do a little cleaning here. And I pass that in and I get something, uh, I won't call this a prediction necessarily, but I get something uh, that is a statement of the uh, topic distribution, okay? So um, we would expect uh, topics uh, zero and one, which are physics and math to do relatively well, right? Uh, 37, 29. And then um, this topic four that's sort of mysterious that we don't really know how to describe yet, um, is also showing up there. So uh, I wanted to show you this tool, or I want to show you this tool, Pi LDAVIS, which I think is um, pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, in a lot of ways. It it's one of the reasons why I think 
that um, we can reframe the idea of personas. It's that uh, we have intelligent ways of visualizing um, relevant words uh, in relation to customers. So um, I think this is the most immediately beneficial thing to someone in marketing. Uh, what we're seeing here are topic bubbles. And uh, these are projected into, into a two-dimensional space, um, you know, PCA for dimensional reduction. And then the, there's this intertopic distance that occurs uh, through this multidimensional scaling. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And uh, the distance is relative um, and the X and Y axis uh, don't mean anything aside from uh, creating a sense of the relative distance. So um, if I click on one of the topics, I see a list of words. And these are set in order of the topic frequency uh, for uh, the word frequency within that topic. Um, we can see here uh, that uh, these words can possibly re represent someone's interests, right? We see mathematician, year, university, mathematics, research, woman, degree, science, study, et cetera. Um, there's this nice tuner in here, uh, the Lambda tuner, which has to do with a metric called relevance, which was proposed by the creators of this uh, visualization. Uh, the creators of pi LDA viz. And it's pretty interesting. If lambda is closer to one, it will essentially show the frequency count of the words for that topic, which is what we're seeing here. Now, if we uh, set lambda close to zero, it will show more definitive terms for that topic. And uh, if we do that, we start seeing degree, PhD, advanced geometry, supervision, bachelor, postdoctoral, uh, et cetera. And uh, you know, if we look at different uh, topics, we might start getting a sense like this. This obviously has to do with physics, right? Uh, particle quantum, uh, scientific astronomer, et cetera. And um, this uh, mysterious topic that we couldn't really place, the one that is so closely affiliated to uh, math, it looks like, um, or, you know, something that looks a little bit more sciencey. You know, we might actually just want four topics here. We might not want five. Uh, given that these topics are so conflated in this instance. So there's a couple things um, that uh, I'm putting here as challenges if anybody wants to do it. Um, you know, try passing in a description of a political figure, right? We don't have that class in this in this uh, presentation, so in this data. So we can pass that in, get a sense of the topic distribution in light of our FIT LDA model. Um, you can also perform LDA on customer descriptions with their dog descriptions, and you might see more emergent topics. Now, uh, you don't want to equate class with topic. Um, a topic can mean something that's hard to interpret, right? We, we have topics uh, up here that aren't really about math. They're not really about physics. Um, well, one of them seems very much about physics, uh, but there's there are a couple things getting mixed up there, and that doesn't mean it's wrong. It it does mean that it's hard to interpret. Um, and sometimes we want to uh, maybe let go of hard to interpret topics, especially um, if we're thinking about this in light of discovering behaviors in uh, customers. Um, also uh, perform LDA on just the dog descriptions. I think that'll be fun. And maybe we'll see how many different ideas that we, you know, how many different topics there are around these dogs. Okay. so. Um, Let's continue from there. Uh, there's a sore spot with topic modeling in regards to validating the model. And I think I just alluded to this. How do you know it's doing a good job? Um, well, a general approach is to put your eyes on it. There are validation metrics available for LDA. There are. Um, but there's yet to be one metric to rule them all. And there's still this primary issue of deciding how many topics on which to train your model. Okay. Um, that's a much bigger discussion. But uh, I kind of want to wrap up with, with some thoughts in regards to personas and um, alternative strategies for uh, two personas. So I talked a lot about a thing, a lot about a lot of things that were faulty with the persona strategy. Um, it's reductive and easily prone to cultural bias, which can have a number of consequences in terms of not recognizing the potential of a product or the use cases by a user and also in terms of potential discrimination. I didn't say this before, but I do believe personas can be done well and in a way that's equitable. I also think it's rare, and I think we should consider other strategies first. Whatever the strategy, I think we should center the wealth of human experience and interests 
instead of centering contrived archetypes. My implication here is that we can consider topics as human interests, which can be updated and they're flexible. Um, these, interests, these interests aren't affixed to a specific persona. Maybe a user can be thought of in terms of being a distribution of interests and experiences, which are also distributed across society. I think topic modeling has the potential to capture at least a little bit of that for the benefit of those providing services, as well as for those utilizing services. Thanks so much. Thank you, I think you have uh, five minutes to tell us about uh, your story with Python, with ML. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, so my my story in um, my story with Python. Um, I started learning Python, I think, because I was doing Java and I was doing PHP, and I um, there were things in those languages that I I would look at Python longingly, and um, at that time I was also uh, working with with uh, students, um, college students on the autism spectrum, and so I would. Uh, design curriculum for them. And in the design of that curriculum, I would uh, just do Python, honestly, because I was like, this is going to be the best ramp for for almost anybody, especially somebody who had, who's different cognitively. Um, but uh, yeah, I started, I think I started programming right around 12 or 11. And um, first language was C, uh, C and some got into C++ for a little bit, but then um, focused almost solely on PHP for a long time, and um, you know, and Java. Uh, in school, I did Java, and then I uh, did Python in school also. Um, but yeah, my background is uh, language studies, and uh, I have a degree in machine learning, and um, those things kind of converged into uh, into working at Galvanize. Um, I went through the uh, the actual boot camp, uh, the data science boot camp that Galvanize has. And um, after that, I um, started uh, doing, you know, uh, kind of part-time uh, presentations and things for them. And uh, while uh, still doing a lot of contract work on the side. And then um, that's kind of evolved into uh, being a Python and stats instructor. So that's, that's kind of the story in, in, my, in my tech space, if that makes sense.